some of you might know that I'm homeless right now. I'm actually between houses um, because of COVID. And it's been six weeks and now it's starting to get a little bit cold at night. So I've had to do something to keep myself warm in my little camper trailer here. Yes, I moved Sleeping Gypsy, my house truck, off the property six weeks ago, thinking that within 10 days or so, I would have myself a new cabin built. But uh, with COVID, I find that all my household effects are still stacked all over my workbench and I can't do any work because I haven't got the building materials to build my cabin. But what I do have is one or two empty tins and a piece of um, chimney flue, 100 millimeter, four inch chimney flue from my fires and a few little two and a half inch terracotta flower pots. And what I'm gonna do is show you how with those things I can make myself a neat little catalytic heater made out of junk that I've got lying around here at home will keep a small space very very warm and heated up in no time at all using these amazing little alcohol burners which you can make yourself from the bottom of two beer cans i've found two particular beer cans that are a little different to most and they i looked at and thought they're going to make a particularly good burner so over the next few minutes i'm going to show you how to make the burner and then I'm going to show you how effective it is in my little camper. It takes about you know, 60 seconds to warm up. And once it's warmed up, the methylated spirits, the alcohol, gasifies between the walls of the stove and starts to pressurize and blow fumes out of the wee holes, which ignite. And you can see that it warms up and gets to a good temperature in no time. And what it's doing is heating up these suspended flower pots, these little two and a half inch um, ceramic flower pots that I've got suspended on a wire inside. I've got five of them in this one. Depending on how tall you build the chimney, you can put in as many as you like. And you can see that my base at the bottom is actually an upside down tuna can. It's a 100 millimeter, four inch diameter food can that's been emptied and then turned upside down and pushed into the bottom. That provides a base so that you haven't got um, heat directly on the bottom. And I'm gonna show you now exactly how it's made. Very, very simple. Two cans of the same type and you'll need the blade out of a um, utility knife. You're gonna use that blade to cut through the aluminium can. And by using a block of wood, 32 millimeters thick, which is an inch and a quarter, that gives me the perfect height to build this little thing and fit it into the gap that I've got available. You can build them taller if you want to. They'll hold more meths and burn for longer. These little ones that I'm building will burn for about 15 to 16 minutes. So it's completely safe to go to sleep with it, knowing that it's gonna warm the place up and go out in just 15 minutes. To cut through the can, you'll need to do what I'm doing for about three to four revolutions of the can. Once you've gone around, it's just a simple matter of um, using your fingers to snap along the scored line. The next thing to do is find yourself something a quarter of an inch thick and add that to the top or get yourself a, another piece of wood that's a quarter of an inch thicker and cut yourself another band. You don't need to cut this all the way. You can actually use scissors because what I'm looking for is a strip and that strip has to be a quarter of an inch deeper than the two halves that you've already made and that will separate it and hold them to the right length. What I'm doing here 
is putting three or four little nicks in the bottom so that the methylated spirits can seep from the main reservoir into the cavity that I'm going to create between the walls of the stove. The whole idea of the stove is capillary action. I'm just cleaning the edges so that everything slips together nicely. And the idea of the strip is that it goes inside and seats into the ring in the bottom of the can that the can sits on when you put it down on the table. What I noticed about these two cans is that the rim is very close to the outside of the can. On a lot of cans that rim is a wee bit closer in and it means that the gap between the two walls is fatter. By getting the gap between the walls really close together they start faster and operate with a higher pressure. Now you need a compass or a map pin, which is one of those plastic headed heavy pins that you push into maps. And you use that to put in about eight tiny little holes all the way around, just um, visually divide the bottom of the can into quarters and then divide each of those quarters in half. And that will give you eight little jets so that can fit together. Then you put this inside sleeve into the with ah yes we put this inside sleeve with the gaps downwards into the bottom part of the can and what i'm going to do here is put little tweaks all the way around the edge to shrink the bottom half of the can and make it fit inside the other so there we go there's our little sleeve going inside and then that goes over there and it's just a simple matter of making sure that all the little bits are tucked in and then pushing it down just work your way around visually checking it to make sure that it's going down evenly don't worry about any crinkles in it because they'll disappear as you get further down and then Give it a few light taps and just check it once again to make sure that it's parallel all the way around. And once it's down and you can see a quarter of an inch gap at the bottom, that means that it's seated right down into the two grooves, top and bottom. Now you need to put a hole in the top. These things were called a penny stove. And the reason they were called a penny stove is because this hole has to be approximately the diameter of a penny. Too small and it won't stay lit, too large and it wastes fuel and won't start operating in the manner that you need it to. So my drill won't take it out the whole way so I've drilled a wee hole and now I'm using ordinary scissors. Don't use mum's best ones, get some second-hand worn out ones because uh, you're going to wreck the tips of them they'll be no good for fabric after this and just work your way around enlarge the hole to about the size of a penny and then you have a stove ready to go clean up any of your raggedy edges with a piece of sandpaper and you're ready to fill it up with meths and get it going So it burns in the center for about 30 or 40 seconds until it starts to warm up and then as soon as it warms up and gasifies you'll see that the uh, the flames start to come out of the holes around the edge So these temperatures that you're seeing now are pretty much 
ambient room temperatures because I've only just put it in. But as it heats the ceramic flower pots, it works as a catalytic heater. <laughs> it works as a catalytic heater, and the whole thing does heat up quite significantly. If you've only got the common sense of a five or six year old, then probably you shouldn't be commenting on the video. I do expect the people who are watching this to know what is safe and only do what they are comfortable doing. That's my version of a disclaimer. Um, in other words, just use your common sense. Don't leave this with children. Don't build it if you're incompetent. And don't bother me with stupid questions. But if you have any sensible questions, if you spot something that I've missed out or something that I haven't explained quite properly, please do ask in the comments below. And if you've got a better idea of how to do this, let everybody know. Let's share. I named my camper Recluse, which is also the name of a South African venomous spider. It's got uh, 200 watts of solar on the roof. The whole thing's made out of offcuts of the insulated panelling that I build projects out of. Quite often I'm left with pieces that can't be used on a customer's job, so I opted to build this trailer from scratch. There's more info in a complete playlist, which is up at the top of the screen now. You can see how I've made uh, the independent trailing arms, which are great off-road, gives loads of ground clearance in the middle. You've got these big, sturdy, steadying legs and some recovery points on the back. Some really nice um, LED lighting. Opening up the pantry. This is all my um, odds and sods for cooking. These are just the, the main things that live in there. Big hefty wheels and tyres, it's uh, braked on a system that operates through Bluetooth so I can adjust the um, braking from my phone in the vehicle as I drive. Very useful on slippery downhills. Got a chainsaw, an axe and a shovel for getting myself out of sticky situations. You'll see a handbrake on the front too so I can park this thing, pull the handbrake on and it's safe on a hill so that I can drive away with a vehicle to go on missions. And here, this is my sink bench. It's on a set of slides and pulls out to reveal more of these alcohol stoves for cooking on. And the bench has a bench. That's a nice little bamboo chopping board on the end. And then on that extrusion above the wheel arch, there's another wee bench that slots in. And this cupboard here I've got my fridge and vegetables in an insulated cupboard. The fridge operates on 12 volts from the power on the roof. And the extension at the rear is to make the sleeping area long enough. I tried to make the trailer as short as possible so that it's as manoeuvrable as possible for in the bush. And of course, when you're camping, you open the back door, pop out another two foot so that you've got enough room to sleep in. This enclosure at the top here has aluminium arms that fold out and a shower enclosure, which can, can be used for the composting toilet or the shower. Lots of camping equipment in the front box there. Let's have a look inside. My little heater fits into a holder that is held by neodymium magnets into the corner. All my solar is in one place here with handy storage cubby holes top and bottom. I've got 200 watts on the roof that gives me plenty of charging for the drone and camera batteries inside. The kitchen, everything's duplicated. I've got another set of um, charging points in there. But back to this little heater. 
here it is held into the corner with neodymium magnets so that in the summertime I just grab it and pull it out but it keeps it steady it's just starting to get dark now and I've um, filled up the reservoir and lit it and I'm just warming up the inside with the door shut I've turned the light on and put a temperature gauge in there so that you can see how warm it gets and just how quickly the temperature sender is um, at the high point and the ambient temperature is being picked up from down on the floor so the two temperatures you're looking at is the highest point inside and the lowest point inside only just put it in 22 degrees on the floor 28 degrees up by the ceiling but over the next few minutes you'll see how that's going to change So that's approximately 15 minutes. Let's have one last look at the temperature as the flame just starts to go out. Almost 37 degrees, which is toasty. Really, really toasty. And all through the time that that was running, I had this in there. This is my carbon monoxide alarm, and it's still reading zero. That's the noise it would have made. Whoops. That's the noise it would have made if there had been an excess of carbon monoxide. But because I had the vent and the roof open, there was no danger at all. The wall's pleasantly warm and getting warmer up towards the roof, but certainly not too hot to touch. Every installation's different. If you choose to do something like this, you're going to need to use some of your own common sense because all mine stays here. Trust me, I need it on a daily basis. Behind where it was sitting, it's warm, but in no danger. As I say, the thing is attached to the wall using neodymium magnets. Doesn't have to be, you could attach this however you like, but what is important is the air gap behind it. Don't put heat shields directly against the wall because that's not how a heat shield works. You need an air gap between a heat shield and whatever it's protecting. So thanks for um, sharing a little bit of time with me, and as I <laughs> As I wait for my building materials to arrive, it's been five weeks now, and I'm just having to amuse myself with my UFO lights underneath my trailer until my building panels arrive. Enjoy.